Hi, this is Julia Wallmüller from Deutsche Kinematik in Berlin, and you're listening to the Film Swap podcast. Here's part two of our conversation with Julia Wallmüller from the Deutsche Kinematik in Berlin. In this episode, we talk about the restoration of the films of G.W. Pabst, the experimental work of Doré O, and Early Sound. We really enjoyed chatting to Julia, and we hope you enjoy it too. Here is a motion picture film. Let's tidy up this tangle of film by putting it on a reel. Welcome back, listeners, and welcome back, Julia and uh, and Jonathan. Hi. So, uh, Hi. Julia, uh, some of the other types of uh, projects you work on, you don't just work on silent films, but you work on films from all different eras of film. And uh, one project that you uh, brought to our attention that we thought would be quite interesting to touch on was the experimental films uh, of a lady called Dor O. Oh. She was an artist who worked from sort of late 60s, early 70s, is that correct? Yes, and that's correct. It, it, would you be all right for people who might not be familiar with um, with Doro about uh, maybe tell the listeners just a little bit about her, just to give, give a little bit of background about her work and the, the types of things that you were um, working on? Yeah, Doro O was uh, one of the most uh, most important German uh, experimental filmmakers, a female experimental filmmakers, which at the time she started was uh, quite rare. There were not many women working in this field. So she was originally um, uh, painting and, uh, and uh, came to, to filming also, to making experimental films. She was... Uh, living and working together uh, with Werner Nikes, who was uh, at this point also one of the most uh, important um, experimental filmmakers. They lived uh, in, um, in, uh, first in Hamburg, where they founded, co-founded together with other people the, the, the um, Film Kooperative in Hamburg. And so they were kind of uh, very important figures, both of them, in in this scene of uh, experimental cinema and initiating, you know, uh, film screenings, and uh, which turned into also important festivals later on for this uh, scene and marking really, a, um, yeah, a, a very uh, impressive um, scene in experimental filmmaking. Um, she has been uh, filming, I think since the mid 60s and uh, later films uh, um, among the films that we digitize and restored are films from yeah from 68 until the 80s I, I'd say that's what we, we basically worked on I have to give the credit for the restoration of uh, the films of Doro uh, mainly to my dear colleague Masha Matzke who was working on on most of the films um, we worked together on the film Alaska, uh, for example. That was the, the first project that we did for her, uh, for Dora, when she was still alive. And um, it's it, it's a very special work to, to work on a film like this. You have to get to know um, the way the films were made, the, the way the films were produced also, which is... Um, a special situation often um, in this field because these films were made also in in um, uh, not a standard workflow. Let's say uh, the people were experimenting uh, with the material out of passion, and uh, you know there was not really a budget for for projects like this. So um, the films are puzzled also together <laughs> out of uh, different materials, um, trying out different, um, different experiments with the, with the film material. Were these films, like because they were shot, a lot of them on sort of 16 millimeter kind of reversal stock and things like yes. that. 
And were there a lot of prints made of these films or were they the kind of things that were shown at very specific screening events? They wouldn't have had like a wide distribution like they would like a commercial fiction it, film. Exactly. At least they didn't uh, expect it that way i'd say because what you can what you can see with these films uh, we had this situation with most of the doro films and and also uh, from the same time uh, vananika's films it's uh, i find the same situation now um that they had it's true they had uh, many films produced on color reversal film stock so this uh, film stock where you have um, you develop it into a positive without having a negative <clears throat> And these films have a very special look. They have a, a, a different way of uh, reproducing colors and a different density than uh, than uh, the films produced in negative-positive process. So it's also a special uh, choice to work with this material, but it's also, of course, cheaper because you don't have to do a negative and then print positive prints from the negative. So what we have in these uh, productions is often that you had positive prints directly uh, printed from the original color reversal film stock. So again, using reversal fil film stock to produce prints. There were several prints. And then some years later, um, they produced, because they maybe then realized, oh, we need more prints because uh, we are quite successful <laughs> with what we're doing. And they have been shown quite a lot always because they, they really had a, a good perception. And um, and uh, so they um, made a negative from their original, color reversal original. And from this negative, then they produce positive prints. So they changed the strategy. <laughs> so this is what happened with lots of Doris films. And for example, uh, with the film Alaska, which is a film from 1968, we have uh, the original materials and prints from the early phase, which are reversal prints. So they look quite, uh, from, from the color and everything, the density, they are quite close to the camera original, actually. Whereas the prints that have been produced later from an inter-negative, they look quite differently. So there's a... Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that was the tricky situation in the case of Alaska when we laid hands on it. Go ahead, Joe. What my question, the films are not very sort of linear. There's not much in the way of narrative, the ones I saw at least. Uh, but, I mean, they're very, very experimental films. Um, so are there any missing pieces? And, I mean, how on earth do you figure out what goes where when putting those back together? Well, uh, luckily those films... Um, often don't need to be put back together. <clears throat> also, in, for these projects, you would uh, start with comparing the film materials. And if everything goes well, then, you know, you compare the different prints that you can find and you compare them with the original camera material. And if uh, the edit is the same, then you don't have a problem in this, in this sense. You don't right. have to re-cut, re-edit anything. So uh, it could happen that you have different versions of a film, for example, an earlier version that has been maybe uh, shortened a bit, or maybe there could be a, a change in, in the edit. This happens. We also had this with uh, some Doro O films, but, but uh, you can basically find out uh, about those changes when you compare the prints with each other. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to choose, okay, what's, what's my strategy? What, what do I consider a valid, more original print? And uh, which print is my main reference for the, for the further work? And how about the sort of sound and music and that side of it? How would, how it, would that, would, I mean, uh, similar? That's basically the same, yeah. You also do comparison of the sound elements that you have of, of the prints, of course, but then also, you know, you have the the magnetic tape where you have the original sound um, and you compare it with the prints and you try to figure out are there any differences. Of course, yeah, the the sound is, is, is quite different uh, um, to compare. Uh, you have this, uh, I think in Alaska, you have this uh, constant... Um, 
kind of noise, uh, which is a combination of different sounds put all put together, getting very loud at a certain point. So it's not uh, not like comparing a, a normal film sound, um, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's what you, you actually always work like this. You compare elements with each other and then you try to figure out what was the original form of the film at the time the film was released. And for example, if you look at the prints, if you look at those uh, different kinds of prints that I described, um, uh, what is very important is also you, you don't, it's not just about edit or, you know, uh, or, or the content of the film, but also about the appearance so what was the original appearance of the film? What did the colors look like? What were the, how, how dark was it? How, how, uh, how light was it? How uh, hard were the contrasts? How intense were the colors? How, how are, do you make those kind of decisions? Because with the films <laughs> like this, where quite often the images, there's a lot of sort of double exposures and, and odd lighting techniques and, and sort of, um, you know, more sort of distorted imagery and things. How do you, how do you know whether that was intentional or not when you are looking at those things and you're trying to convert them to, to create a, a digital version that looks like the original? How do you make those decisions about what, like, was that supposed to be like that or is that somewhere on the film print or... Um, how, how can you how can you make those estimations? Yeah, usually, the the process in in the digital restoration workflow that uh, where you have to decide uh, where you have to decide uh, um, uh, concerning colors, lights, and so on, contrasts is is the digital color grading. So in the color grading, we work together with professionals who do this as a job in post production, for example. <clears throat> and if we are happy, we can work with somebody who has uh, experience with analog film and restoration projects. Um, usually, for this uh, for this um, part of the work, we use prints. We try to find a good print from the original production period, um, and we uh, watch the prints in projection in a cinema, and we watch them together with the digital colorist with the person who is doing the, 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 the actual technical work. <laughs> and, uh, and if we can, we watch it uh, with the filmmakers, if they are still alive and if they are interested in participating in the project. So that's uh, when we work uh, on films from the second half of the last century, uh, we often find ourselves in the lucky situation to be able to work with the directors or the DOPs in some cases. And uh, we invite them to join the process, to be there and try together to figure out uh, what the film looked like. And in the, the best case that we can have is really that we have a good print, a reliable print, where we can see exactly those, uh, you know, where, that gives us these guidelines about the appearance of the color and everything. So, and then the next step would be... millimeter reversal film stock from, say, 50 years ago, Does how does that hold up in comparison to some of the nitrate stocks and things that you were talking about from earlier silent films? Do, uh, they, do they hold up better? Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't burn, but anyway, they fade uh, to red, especially color film stock. <clears throat> um, often is faded so um, that's a big problem a big issue and that it, it doesn't have have to be like this it also depends on how the film has been stored it depends on the the, the manufacturing uh, phase you know there were uh, more stable years like uh, you have a uh, better and worse uh, years for wine, you have better and worse years for color film stock because they were constantly trying to improve, to work on certain aspects. And then uh, some some years you really have this uh, very, very instable colors that fade away almost instantly. And then again, uh, we have uh, films from the 70s, from the 60s, who are at least the originals in perfect condition and the colors are beautiful still. Hmm. So, for example, for Alaska, which was really a, a, funny, a funny thing or an interesting example, we had 
I think, five different prints. Mm. And all the prints look different. Mm. Not just not just that in the way that one print looked a bit more reddish and the other one more greenish, but uh, the, the single scenes, the single motives, I would say, because it's hard to talk about scenes with these kind of uh, images that you have in experimental film, it's more like motives. Uh, or, or, yeah, mo let's, let's stick to motives. Um, they all looked different uh, within each other. So uh, uh, one image that would look greenish in one print would look totally different in another one. Or one that was printed in black and white in one uh, print would be printed in orange in another one. So it was not, you know, you, you could not, you really could not tell uh, which was a good print because every print uh, had is its own way of changing colors constantly mm -hmm. and changing the look constantly. So that was really a special case because usually you can say, okay, this print is a bit reddish. I I know why, because the color fades and red is the most stable color of the colors in the film. So that's why they turn to turn reddish. They have this red uh, appearance. And uh, and in this case, it was really impossible to figure out which print would be a good uh, a good reference. On top of that, as you as you said, you have this very you know not real not realistic looking images, double exposures or multiple exposures, and of course they they were um, uh, playing with you know um, superimpositions and. Uh, dark scenes and very light scenes and nothing looks looks natural so you don't have any guideline at all if you don't have a good print mm. not any really so that's it, it's really crucial to find a print and in, in in the case of alaska it was impossible to decide which print would be a good reference for us so we talked to dora and we said can't you come to berlin she's living she was living in mülheim on the ruhr which is kind of the center of germany in the famous uh, ruhrpott i'm sure you know what I mean <laughs> and um, and uh, she she said no she just can't because she was not in the physical condition to travel to Berlin and so what we normally do is invite the filmmakers here and and do the work together but since it was not possible for Dora at this time we decided to uh, pack the prints in a suitcase and go to where she was <laughs> <laughs> So Masha and I, we we yeah we um, packed the prints in a suitcase and went to Mülheim an der Ruhr, and uh, and she organized or organized um, a screening at a place called Makroscope, which was kind of a center for uh, experimental images, I think, if I recall it correctly. Very very uh, nice people that arranged a, a screening environment for us with a projector, a 60 millimeter projector, and. We watched those five prints uh, a whole afternoon. The film is about 14 minutes long, I think. <laughs> so we watched five prints, and we prepared some kind of um, some kind of uh, you know scene or motive protocol where we took notes. And she was she could not tell us before. Well, this motive should be should look like this or like that. But when she saw the prints. She could say, "Well, this looks right." No, but this doesn't look right, and so she was quite sure in the moment that she saw it, which should be the right way. And uh, and we took the notes, and then we tried to reconstruct uh, reconstruct the the color appearance uh, based on those notes that we had. Wow! <laughs> so it was really tricky, and then she saw the result, and she was very happy with it. Sure. Um, that was something you really needed uh, there for. Otherwise, you'd have just yes. been sort of guessing, essentially. We would have been kind of lost. Yeah. Yes, yeah. kind of lost. Because really, uh, if you can't even say a print changed in a certain way, like everything turns a bit red, you know, you can abstract this uh, reddish tone. You can just take it away and try to guess what the image looked like. But in this case, apparently... Every time they printed, I mean, you did this in analog um, 
film production you to determine in the color timing process, which is the, the, the analog color grading, um, you would set lights and colors for each and every shot. And apparently they did it in different ways for the different prints. And we found marks on the original also indicating that they had been doing this in a different way. Always, at least they made different marks for every time they printed or <laughs> I'm not sure. We, we also, I, I tried to phone every, um, every person I could uh, guess, uh, uh, phoning, uh, trying to find out where these prints were made and in which way. And, but, but, you know, nobody could help. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that. But especially for these films, it's really crucial to have, to have good prints. So I'm right now working on uh, Veronica's films and, I also have lots of lots of prints, but I can can say quite uh, with um, I can I can be quite sure about which prints are good and which are not. Mm. And usually, the older ones that are on color reversal film are better, in most cases. Mm. Well, they are certainly really interesting films. I quite enjoyed uh, watching them. Um, Alaska is amazing, but to, I mean, all of them are really cool. I, I was going to ask you a question about some of the music in some of the later films, because mm -hmm. were, were these pieces of music that were recorded specifically for the projects or were they pre-recorded music that she chose to accompany the images? Because some, really some of them depends. reminded me of kind of like the, those uh, Alfred uh, Deller recordings, you know, the uh, the, voc the the kind of ancient vocal folk songs and things, those mm -hmm. kind of recordings. So they kind of reminded me that of that. So I was just curious about whether she chose pre-existing music or whether they they were made specifically for the for the film. Uh, it really depends. Sometimes it's not even music, but just sounds like uh, different sounds uh, put together. Like in Alaska, I think it's uh, you can hear some violin sounds, uh, but also yeah. some strange, maybe a hair dryer, or it, yeah. it's just so many sounds put together that it's hard to to find out. Um, for some of her films, uh, the music was made by Anthony Moore, who is also quite known apparently in the. Uh, in in the circle of experimental uh, film, but also experimental music um, people, uh, and uh, and he composed or or created, let's say, created music to to some of her films also. But what you what is quite obvious often when you see those films, but it really depends on the film that. The, the the music is or the sound is not you know like composed uh, in a way that you would compose for a normal film. So it's more like a piece of music or a piece of sound for a piece of film, not yeah. to be synchronized too much. We yeah, also and could create that atmosphere and, and things that sort yes. of adds to the um, mystery or allure of the images that you're seeing. Yes. But it really depends. So in the case of Alaska, for example, one also one thing about the prints was that the music, which is is faded in at the beginning of the film over a, a very long fade in, was and this was done differently in every print. So obviously manually uh, in every print, sometimes the fade in would last like 20 seconds and sometimes it would last two minutes or something like this. And, and uh, so that's also something that we, at a certain point, had to decide, okay, uh, we will use this, and this print as a reference for, for the way the sound has been faded in. Mm. Well, yeah. it was really interesting. I think I might take an opportunity just to quickly um, plug, the, uh, plug the DVD for this because uh, you very kindly sent me the link so I could get one, but it's called... Uh, Figures of Absence, the films of Doro, and it's a DVD, and it's available from a company called Rivoir. And yes. uh, I can include the uh, the um, link to that in the show notes, so that if people are interested in checking this out, which I think they 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 should be, um, they can pick this up because it's a really really fascinating collection of short films, 
Uh, and I really enjoyed it a lot, and I can see myself going back to that. That's and so if you're cool. interested in, in her work, you should uh, certainly uh, watch out for the book published mm. by uh, uh, Masha Matzke, my colleague, uh, with the same name, Figures of, uh, Figures of Absence. So there is also a book about Dora, or a beautiful book, uh, where you can see... Is, is, that of, hmm? is, is it available now, or is that... Yes, it is available. It, had, it has been published uh, more or less at the same time, like the DVD. Oh, okay. So they, okay. they go together. Well, <laughs> and you have I mean, it sounds very like nice it. image material and, and very good texts in the book as well. Okay, and the lady who wrote the book was your colleague who worked on the restoration. Yeah, she actually, yes, yes. Brilliant. Yes. Okay, well, yeah, definitely, folks. I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes so that you can go and um, investigate that further because they are definitely really interesting and uh, it's worth checking out. If it's okay, just before we um, wrap up, we want, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of films that you worked on. Uh, from what I understand from our uh, initial conversations, you weren't initially involved in the project, but you sort of um, became involved um, after it had started. Uh, but there's a couple of films by G.W. Paps that uh, were recently released on, uh, on home media uh, called West Front 1918, and uh, I want to make sure I say this right, Kameradschaft. Yeah, that, that's quite good. <laughs> it would be in English that would translate to sort of uh, comradeship. Wouldn't comradeship, it? exactly. Yeah. I think that's the international title. But they, these are two really, really, really brilliant films, like just, you know, masterpieces, really. Um, and they both go together really well because West Front 1918 is sort of a, uh, tells the... It gives you a, a first-hand uh, account of life in the trenches during the, fir the First World War. Uh, and then the second film is uh, tells the story of a mining disaster that happens on the French and German borders after the war. And they kind of go together because they uh, sort of show, uh, they share some of the same cast and things as well, but they kind of show the experience of the soldiers during the war and and just everyone during the war really and then then kind of shows how the workers and everyone came home and the kind of economic conditions and the sort of working conditions and stuff that they experienced after and and they're both really brilliant kind of anti-war films because they they show very much the idea of uh, people helping out one another when there's adversity and overcoming these sort of nationalistic sort of barriers when there's crisis and things. And I, I think they're really, really, really amazing films. The the camera shaft, especially some of the quite harrowing conditions in the mines. And apparently this was all shot in the studio, which I was quite surprised to read about. But uh, some of these scenes are incredibly harrowing and very realistic. Uh, in these conditions, uh, working in these mines, and then when the catastrophe happens and the shaft starts to collapse and things like that, it's very realistic, very harrowing and and, and um, uh, exciting. And uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because you were involved in these restorations and they're such great films, some of the uh, challenges about restoring them. C certainly in the case of the, the second film, there there's even bits missing isn't there there's there's one point where a title card comes up to say well this scene's missing and it sort of describes it uh, and there's all throughout the film there's little bits where there's frames missing and things so could you tell us a little bit about the process of of um reconstituting these films yes yes um there, there were um Different challenges. I mean, um, for West Front, we uh, we had the challenge also that uh, we had lots of missing parts. Um, both both films are based again on uh, material that has been preserved in the British Film Institute National Archive. <laughs> yeah. so, what would we do without you? <laughs> And uh, these were uh, duplicate, duplicate, duplicate positives uh, with sound that have been preserved there, that have been obviously produced for, for the international market. Um, 
West Front 1918 had been shortened quite a bit. Um, apparently, uh, many scenes missing and also bits and pieces missing. And so the, the, the aim for this restoration was also to, uh, to try to fill the gaps, which of course for a sound film is even more crucial than for a silent film because you would also have a, a gap in the sound. And mm. that's what makes it more complicated as well. To, to fill the gaps, there was a, a material conserved in Bundesarchiv uh, from the Presence Film um, collection there. And, uh, and well, Pabst is, is uh, as you might heard, very famous for his kind of uh, cutting. And it's said that, um, for his editing, and it's said that, you know, it was not uh, by coincidence uh, where he did choose to do a cut and how, and, and, and that it was always on, on total purpose, the, the choice on until which frame exactly a scene should last. So, so it's this uh, thing about the Pops films that you say you have to really try to reconstruct everything in full length, which is more like, again, a silent film topic. But in this case, we have sound. It was the first sound film, West from 1918 by Pops and uh, the soundtrack is also quite heavy. I mean, you described the, the, the really natural images, but also the sound is really heavy. And I just read the, the, a review or um, uh, not, not the review itself, but somebody telling uh, um, from the premiere of the film that people, many people left the cinema shouting out that this was just unbearable. And how could how, how can you dare to show something like this to us? <laughs> mm, wow, 1930, right? So people were still very traumatized, and obviously he, he perhaps as well. And that's what he tried to do, also with this, uh, also with this terrible ending and this very strong message, also at the end of the film. Yeah, and um, and so. Uh, this material in in uh, in uh, uh, this British material that we had uh, has a soundtrack. The, the sound was uh, typical for this um, for this period. Um, a bit difficult. It is a, a special um, um, sound uh, track that is called variable density soundtrack. Um, it doesn't look like modern film sound. Maybe you have seen the the way the sound track looks like today, more like a like a uh, this uh, curve from the hospital monitors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, back then, it was uh, it, it it looked more like a leather. So it is different kinds of uh, densities. Um, a, 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 a track with different uh, densities and each density represents a, a certain way of sound so it's a different system which has generally more problems you have more noises getting into the film sound that could disturb you and uh, it's a very very it depends very much on the quality of the printing that has been done and also the quality of the digitization that you do so you have to digitize those sounds with a special technique usually and be sure not to bring in more problems digitizing the sound uh, than it actually has so um, we had lots of sound restoration done on this film and of course, it was also a big challenge to match the different sounds from this British material and the German material that was used to to fill the gaps that we had in the British material. And there were there were um, yeah there, there was lots of uh, work necessary. And sometimes maybe you notice that that it's a bit hard to understand. The sound quality is not very good, but they tried their best to really get out as much as possible from the sound that was there. But the understandability of the sound of the dialogues is a big issue in this early 30s, the early, very early uh, sound films. So all the, all the sound was original sound you managed yes. to find. You didn't have to, I mean, there's lots of explosions. <laughs> You didn't have to. You didn't have to get sort of explosion sounds or anything like that. To sort of fill it no. in. No. Okay. I mean, from from old materials, yes. Old, uh, old, yeah. Yes, there was no original sound negative that 
surely existed somewhere, but right. didn't exist anymore. The original negative of this film also is lost. And, um, and image-wise, it was the same like I described before with Waxworks, trying to match uh, certain uh, uh, looks uh, that don't look alike, <laughs> trying to match them. And in the case of West Front, there was even a special technique used um, which was uh, if you if you change from one source to the other and you had the change in image quality, fadings, small fadings were done. So we had small fadings over, I guess, like two to six frames where one um, source would, one image would fade into the other one to make the, the change smoother. That's something you could really, um, you really have to question, in my opinion. Um, the decision was made. I was, I, I, I wouldn't have made it myself that way. I would say because because it's creating new images. Actually, those faded, digitally faded images have not been there before. So you don't have to just one change. You don't have just one change from one material to the other, but also newly created images in these fadings. Um, the effect can be positive because it's smoother. You don't have these interruptions, so it's maybe better for the audience to watch. But it's something that you can, you know, uh, regard with a critical view, certainly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As you see, you see <laughs> Options and decisions. It's uh, the the important thing is that uh, for me, if you take such a decision, that you communicate this also and you make it uh, you know transparent. You document it so it can be understood what you did. In the end, what is been done uh, uh, within these digital restorations is, and also the analog restorations before is creating new versions. Also, a print from a very old nitrate print is a new print, is a new version. Of course, now we go digital, which is a fundamental change of image, but still, it's a new version. Anyway, this version can be, should be as close to the original as possible. But, of course, you know, depending on the person uh, working on the project, taking the decisions, this will be, uh, yeah, there are many many ways of uh, of producing um, uh, this new version. So do you still preserve the original original, like before you, like when you make these changes, um, do you still save the other? The film material, yeah. of course, that would be the most important thing. <laughs> well, it's always yeah. possible that future generations, like in another sort of 30, 40, 50 years, someone else might sit down and try and do another restoration. Yes. Like if they find some additional materials or something, they might sit down and try again to do it. So it's important yes. to document those, those decisions so that they can potentially undo them if they wanted to or... Totally. And usually you also uh, archive the raw scan of the film, meaning when you scan the film before you do any intervention to the image, you would archive this one, which is especially important for material which uh, has deterioration going on because, uh, you know, the film will not be in the same condition in 30, 40 years when somebody might take the decision to do something differently than you have done it. So, but if you preserve the raw scan and it's mm -hmm. good quality, high quality scan, then the, the next generation really has the possibility to work with the raw scan in case the original film material has, uh, is just in a much worse condition and maybe mm -hmm. cannot be used in the same way anymore. So mm -hmm. that's what usually is done. But doesn't that bring up its own kind of challenges, though, in terms of the technology? Because you could do a scan now and it's preserved on a hard drive or something, but then there's a reliance on that technology still being useful 30, 40, 50 years from yes. now, and that those pieces of equipment will still work. Or, you know, so there's always this constant process of having to try and 
back everything up and save everything as yes, much migration. Place. Migration, yeah. <laughs> and of course, as an archive, that's what we deal with uh, yeah. constantly. We produce data, lots of data, and uh, because if you do a 4K scan of a film, you have uh, tons of data, and so you have to migrate them all the time to keep them accessible. And usually, you have systems, and you have to, you know, uh, double um, uh, store them because you cannot risk that one system is breaking down so you have a double or triple um, storage and mm -hmm. you have to migrate your systems and never just leave it in the shelf on a hard drive because the hard drive maybe next year mm -hmm. uh, will not work anymore if you don't use it so that, that's a real that's a, a whole machinery running behind those shelves not, not literally but <laughs> that's, that's what uh, Colleagues of me are dealing with how to how to keep all this data accessible. Yeah. Do you see in the future? Um, can you see other technologies on the horizons or any sort of developments in sort of restoration technology and things that could potentially improve or make your work easier in the future or better or? Do you, do you know of things on the horizon? That... Um, easier and better? I'm not sure for the moment. I mean, there are, of course, technologies that are being offered, <clears throat> like HDR uh, technology, which, to my understanding, is maybe interesting for uh, for companies who want to just, you know, release Blu-rays of old films and and uh, do cover this kind of market. As far as I understood, for what we aim at is uh, which is cinema, seeing films in cinema. That's our main objective. Blu-rays are uh, nice to have, but um, but we restore for the cinema. And HDR, as far as I understand, is not the relevant technology um, at the moment for for uh, cinema projection. Mm. Um, it's fundamentally sort of recolor grading things again as well, isn't it? It's it's changing, isn't it? When they go in and do these new HDR yeah. masters, they're kind of re grading the colors and things aren't they so yes the, the appearance i mean in theory you can show more detail and uh, uh you know uh, but but then you have to wonder uh, okay who will be equipped at home properly to to see all those details and mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes when you i mean for for me it's always hard to see the outcome of a restoration on any kind of screen, which is not a cinema screen, because uh, the way the colors are being displayed on on the on the monitor is always wrong. <laughs> it's always yeah. hard to look <laughs> at at this material on on something that is not cinema. A yeah, cinema it screen. is especially because a lot of these modern televisions they add in so much extra processing and, and things contrast, like that. Color, and the no, colors are more intense. Yeah, and the average person, when they get a new TV, they just kind of whack it in and just leave it on the default settings, and they don't necessarily calibrate them and things as well. So I, I often see in people's, when I go over to visit other people in their houses, the, the televisions have really sort of day glow colors and the motion smoothing makes everything really jittery. Yeah. And and they don't even seem to notice. <laughs> and I'll yeah, be sitting there you trying get to used go. To it or you even made the choice, no? You uh, yeah. you maybe even took the settings, uh, made the settings in that way. So that's yeah. that's difficult. And uh, of course, AI is also something that uh, is constantly being offered uh, to archives to uh, make the work easier. Um, I don't know because what I see, I mean, of course. In digital with, within the digital workflow, we work with uh, quite advanced technology. We work with um, tools that are especially designed for for film restorations in terms of retouching images, so removing scratches or removing dust or damage from mm -hmm. the digitized images. And these are very specialized tools. 
and uh, and uh, it's just algorithms in the end. Um, mm. But seeing the different kinds of results that you can have depending on the person, choosing the parameters for those tools, and that they are quite complex. You can, it's not just you know press the button and go. So for each tool, you have lots of parameters which influence the way the tool works and the way the tool works without creating digital artifacts or with creating digital artifacts. That's something, it's a very uh, important topic when you talk about retouching of, uh, of images, digital retouching, then you can ruin the material completely mm -hmm. um, by creating new artifacts. So, uh, and you see the different outcome depending on the person, you know, on, on the people working with those tools. So if I imagine, okay, an, an AI uh, setting those parameters, evaluating if there are, if errors have been made or if, if the outcome is good or... Mm. I think uh, still a bit difficult for me to imagine, but I'm a restorer, so I'm a, um, you know, not the most modern person, maybe. <laughs> One of the interesting stories at the moment in the news is this, you know, Vesuv Vesuvius project, how they're uh, sort of analysing, using AI, these uh, scrolls that were sort of incinerated at her... Um, in the uh, explosion at uh, Vesuvius, as a Pompeian her hericulum, whatever it's called. And um, so basically they've got these sort of charred lumps, essentially, and they're sort of um, using AI to figure out the script on them. And mm -hmm. so a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, they got their sort of first results, I think, perhaps it was just before Christmas. And you sl I slightly wonder, well, perhaps they could use a sort of similar thing for sort of... Um, with the cakes, the the, the, the <laughs> celluloid cakes, to find out uh, you know what the the film looked like. I don't know. Maybe mm. that's maybe it's easier with charred papyrus than it is with celluloid. But, I no. guess not. It's it's not just uh, baked together uh, this cake. It's also that uh, I don't know if you once saw. I mean, the beautiful images of decomposed. Uh, nitrate film material what happens is also that you know the 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 image the silver image yeah. is embedded in a gelatin emulsion and what happens if all this uh is decomposing that the image just melts away uh, okay. within the emulsion so you have this really there are very nice, very nice artistic projects using this kind of material and uh, uh, making experimental films out of it. it it's really beautiful uh, how, how the image disappears into the emulsion. So, so it really, it just vanishes. But of course, I mean, what you say, analyzing the image, that's something that we already apply, but not within artificial intelligence tools, but within those tools uh, the digital retouching is working with. So yep. it's analyzation of image content, comparing um, several images with each other and trying to find out, oh, if I have a white spot here, what is happening on the same spot in the adjacent frames? And is this something that belongs to the image or might it be a dust or something, you know? Right. That's how it works. Analyzation and then... Uh, maybe a replacement. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe you also heard the famous story about uh, the Snow White, you know, the Disney film where the sparkling of the diamond uh, cave has been retouched away. No, I haven't heard <laughs> that. <laughs> so you use the algorithm on it today. Sparkling appears on one frame only, like dust. Also, if you have a, a you know, a water surface where you have reflections of light, they appear on just one frame, and that's how dust is defined for those algorithms. Mm -hmm. White things that appear on one frame only. <laughs> but fortunately, we have, uh, yeah, as I say, parameters that let us control those tools, and we have people sitting there right. controlling those parameters. <laughs> so oh, funny. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I'm sure uh, our AI tools are used already, of course, in certain, uh, I mean, 
it's important to differentiate between film restoration and things like remastered versions or, you know, as I said, remastering for Blu-ray editions only. The thing is that everything can claim to be a restoration. That's a bit of a problem because this is not a protected term, right. restoration, or a restorer is not a protected profession. Yeah. So you could call everything a restoration. So just watch you know, everything with um, an open eye. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have a real pet peeve as a as a collector of of, of films on Blu-ray and things. When uh, you know, because a lot of these film libraries have changed hands over the years for different corporate entities, and every time uh, someone else takes over a library, they if they reissue a film, they have this thing about they have to take the original uh, distributor's sort of logo off the beginning of the film and then put their own corporate branding on the films. And that just drives me crazy. Um, Studio Canal is one that they do it all the time. They sort of strip off the original sort of headers at the beginning of the films and add their own sort mm -hmm. of branding. And that kind of thing really annoys me because I think when I purchase a film, I want as close to the original as... as um, as it was originally seen in the cinemas when it when it was released. So for me, any kind of alterations of any kind are, I find it offensive. Sorry, mm -hmm. George Lucas, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, so that's why I think uh, you're doing God's work, aren't you? Because you're out there and you're, you and your colleagues are working hard to preserve, you know, uh, these historical artifacts and these these bits of our culture and, uh, and things and keeping them uh, keeping them alive for future generations and I think that's um, it's very important and very very uh, great um, so um, just in the interest of time because it is it is getting on a bit and I, I could quite happily listen to you talk about uh, film restoration for for hours but um, you probably want to uh, go home and go to bed at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it's been um, a long day. <laughs> um, if I may, could, could I just ask you, um, uh, is there any kind of current projects that you're working on or things that you could uh, let the audience know about that are coming up that, that you'd like to draw attention to or, or yeah. tell people to watch out for? Well, as I, I mentioned, I'm diving uh, very deep into Van Anika's films uh, now, and I'll, I'll be doing that for mostly for the rest of the year. Uh, we've already made the plans, and I, <laughs> I guess it's going to be me working on those films. And, and certainly, since he's a very important figure on this whole field, in this field, I suppose that there will be chances to see. Uh, the restorations, I hope, also uh, internationally. And I I can only recommend also for the Dore O films, if you have a chance to see them in cinema, go to the cinema. That would be my recommendation anyway for all films. <laughs> Watch out for the programs of the, um, you know, the, the, the BFI, I'm sure, also has a very nice program. Uh, for example, but uh, but uh, these films really have to be seen in cinema. So experimental films, the the experience uh, experience that you make with image and sound on the big cinema screen is just totally different from from small screens and sometimes just bearable there. I'd say. <laughs> so the film I just finished, uh, Divan by Vananikas, is uh, something like this. And then I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm also working on a Lubitsch film from 1918, oh, The great. Eyes of the Mummy Ma. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Roughly translated. I, I uh, have you that somewhere, but it's very, very Which cool. has a, a severe black-facing issue, but um, 1918. Well, back to the <laughs> question <laughs> from before. <laughs> yeah, but it's also a very interesting, uh, challenging reconstruction project Um still deep into the reconstruction phase. So there's okay. some work to go, and I hope since it's Lubitsch, uh, Paula Negri, and Emil Jannings, I hope we're, we're going to be able to show it also on an international level. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out for that because that sounds amazing. 
Um, I will, because uh, I always do, but I totally wholeheartedly agree with you that um, seeing these things up in a, in, a, in a big, in a cinema on the big screen is always ideal, but obviously it's not always practical for people as well. So I will just draw attention again to some of the, the things that we talked about tonight. Uh, the PABS films are available from Masters of Cinema, and there's also uh, Criterion Editions in the United States. And I think you showed me earlier a really lovely oh, yes. edition from Germany of the... Yes, it's uh, the <clears throat> Atlas film edition of those two um, PABS films, really beautiful with uh, very nice booklets inside. Um, where you can read some also some uh, reviews from the time of production and interesting texts also about the restoration of the films. Very nice. Okay. So, yeah, so collectors, look out for those. And also we talked about Waxworks, which is also available from Masters of Cinema in the UK, and I believe uh, Flickr Alley uh, yes. the Blu-ray in the United States. So, again, they're, they're really interesting films, really worth uh, checking out, whether you can see them in a cinema or get the Blu-rays or see them on streaming or however you get your films, check them out. And, and I'll put note in the show notes about the uh, figures of absence, the Doro films, so that people, uh, if they are interested, they can look out the, there's a DVD and also the book as well, uh, all about her work. And uh, it's very interesting stuff. So by all means, uh, check it out. And I'll mention too that on the Waxworks uh, Blu-ray, there is an interview with yourself, isn't there, Julia? Um, yes. Yeah talking about the restoration of the film and some of the detective work that went into uh, restoring it. So um, if you want to hear more, by all means, go and check that out as well, because it's excellent. Thank um, you. So great. I'll, I have one more question, just looking at your shelves behind you. Any chance at all, possibly, that you've got the Mag Magnificent Ambersons kicking around back there somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have we have some some um, quite famous uh, Berlin uh, film here, maybe um, uh, by the the Berlin-based filmmaker Rosa von Braunheim, uh, mm -hmm. quite known here uh, for his uh, for his uh, filmmaking. Uh, which is called Berlina Bettworth, but it wouldn't say anything to you now, I fear. <laughs> I mean, everything is uh, German uh, here. Do you have a uh, dark little corner of stuff that you haven't cataloged yet and you don't know what it is and there might be some amazing treasures lurking somewhere in the I, corner? I guess we have more or less cataloged everything, which doesn't mean that we have looked into every can. So sometimes really um, it, it still happens that, uh, you know, something is written on the can and something else is inside. So this, this happens also with newer films. Uh, to me, it happened, for example, with the film by Rosa von Braunheim that I just mentioned, um, a film about Anita Berber, a famous German nude dancer from the <clears throat> from the twenties, and he made a film about her. And, and there was, for example, a can uh, where there was supposed to be the trailer inside, and there was a trailer, but there was also a re original material from the film itself. So mm -hmm. it was a, a nice surprise, even even within a film from the eighties. <laughs> Well, so that happens. Oh uh, well, that must be one of the the most fun parts of the job when you uh, find find in the little treasures. Yes. And just going, hey, what have we got here? Amazing. Every time you open a film can, something awaits you. Sometimes it's a uh, it's an ugly surprise, and sometimes it's <laughs> a beautiful, nice surprise. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's great. I mean. Um, yeah, like I said, if I if I you let me in there, you'd probably never get me out. I'd be, I'd be like, oh, what's this? <laughs> uh, well, Julia, thank you so much for taking time out to speak to us. It's been uh, it's been amazing, really interesting, and uh, we really appreciate you taking time out to come and speak to us. Um, hopefully, you'll come back again and tell us more of that when you have some more um, interesting projects uh, that come out, uh, and you can come back and. Tell us a bit more about that. That'd be uh, that'd be lovely. Yeah, with pleasure. Thank you very much for your interest and your questions. 
Terrific. Thank you very much. It's been Great. fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I'm glad. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, listeners, uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, Jonathan and I will be back in a couple of weeks to talk about some more great films. And uh, we hope to see you then. Until then, take care. And uh, we'll see you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Film Swap podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving the show a rating or leaving a review. This helps other listeners find the show. You can follow the Film Swap on social media. We're on Twitter and TikTok at Film Swap UK, on Instagram at Film Swap Media, and on YouTube at Film Swap underscore podcast, and at Facebook at Film Swap The Podcast. Oh, that's the thing these nerdy middle aged men get up to. Oh. <laughs>